And I think that would be explicit knowledge of the good and bad before later on in their, let's say, teenage or in their 20s, when they actually reach that level of theoretical understanding of the good or the bad or whatever, then they can actually choose between them. And I think that's the really the only only thing that we can do to try to turn a person to good or enlighten them. Because I don't think it's, I don't think even if you, let's say, even if a really, really smart person understood the theoretical laws of physics and came to you and tried to explain it all, I don't think that person, that person would understand the concepts vaguely, maybe, but they won't be able to truly, really understand that concept, like the person who's explaining it to them. That's not possible. And that's simply going to, that's simply going to revert back to Plato's method of philosopher kings go out and then they come back in to teach. So that will be my method. Um, prep them as much as possible by making them, by challenging their ideals of good and bad over and over again until eventually and inevitably life will hit them with the decision where they would need to choose between good and bad. And perhaps that period can be perhaps monitored or they could be on a probation period for becoming a guardian or pre-guardian maybe. I'm not completely sure about that detail, but I think if something like that happened, then it would be a little more effective than simply trying to make, make these clueless people understand the concept of theoretical physics on first bat without truly understanding it. Yeah. I wonder, I, um, Tim, did you have a follow-up question or are you? you I wonder if, if you'll forgive me, um, I wanna kind of turn everything a little upside down <laughs> or maybe zoom out a little. I'm not sure how I'd wanna say it, but I guess I hear you putting a lot of emphasis on the kind of moral and uh, political education of the philosophers and the guardians, right? And this kind of, um, this learning and this training of being able to discern what is good. I think that's right. But I'm just remembering this passage in book two, which is at 368D, where he talks about why we're talking about a city at all. And he says, the sort of inquiry for us to make about it seems to me exactly like this. If someone had ordered people who were not very sharp-sighted to read small print from a distance, and then it occurred to someone that maybe the same letters are also somewhere else, both bigger and on something bigger, it would plainly be a godsend, I assume, to read those first and examine the smaller ones by that means, if they were exactly the same. There's justice, we claim, of one man, and there's presumably also justice of a whole city. And then he describes, he says, we're going to look, we're going to examine justice by means of the city as an image of the soul, as the image of a, an individual philosopher, proto-philosopher, beginning philosopher. So I wonder, is there a way that, is there a way that you understand the education of the cave, of the philosopher kings as, um, not simply about the political governance of a city. What would it mean for this to be an image of what's happening internally in one individual? Um, I think that could fairly easily be explained because essentially what the guardian class and what the philosopher kings are supposed to act as is the brain of the city because they are supposed to be, first of all, I would guess, I would say they could work as both the brain, but mostly as the moral guard of the individual soul, I guess. Your conscience, we would say. But so think I think, that, sorry, yes, go ahead. Oh, well, no, I just, I want to hear the rest of what you're saying. I'm sorry to interrupt you. But aren't they also concerned about the difference between what is and what, what seems to be? Is it, is it is it simply about what's good and what's right? Or is there something also, of what's real, what's true, which includes the moral and the good, but it doesn't, that it doesn't seem only that. I went, yeah, what do you think? I mean, sure, like, of course, like, concerning the like of course like do we exist like the fundamental questions of human existence that's that's always going to be a question but also i feel like the primary focus even let's say if we look at the human being the the city the entire city or the human being like uh plato suggests within within the text like you pointed out then i think the primary focus on on these guardian on the guardian classes function which would be which would be the moral conscience of the person should be on the fact that that conscience is not uncorruptible, but at the very least can resist against the rest of our desires. Because a human being isn't uncorruptible, and a human being very obviously has some kind of some kind of negative thought or some kind of bad thought. 
even even the nicest person in the world is going to have some kind of negative thought within their mind, even if it's buried deep in their unconscious or they're just or they just consciously resist it. And in both cases, the, our conscience or our moral virtues, whatever it is, is going to play a strong part in suppressing that whether it's subconsciously or consciously. And for that to function properly, and I think that is the and that should be put a priority. And of course, the fundamental of what am I? What? Why am I here? And why does the world exist? And the fundamental question is reality. Obviously, that's important for the person. And in this case, we're Did it freeze for you, Sam? Yeah. Give it a minute. Sorry. Oh, oh, you froze. Oh, am I okay now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I think the I think I think that that's that's good and that's essential. The the talk of reality, the talk of why are we here, and all of that. And I think that's essential in the city self actualizing on like what's actually going on, and that would of course elevate the city into a new new level, and that that makes sense. But also at the same time. It's the first thing that should be there, in my opinion, is that safeguard against corruption within our mind, within the individual soul's mind, or in this case, within the city, so that the basic functions and the cogs of society can turn. I know I'm turning to the political side that you told me to turn away from, but I think before we can start discussing theoretics and before we can start trying to elevate ourselves to a new level of human conscience, by truly, truly thinking about the reality, thinking about what we are made of, why are we here, and the fundamental questions that defines our lives, I think before we can do that, we need to solidify the baseline, which is no one is killing each other within the city, or trying to bribe someone, or etc. What whatever corruption you may think of within your mind, and everything that we imagine of corruption within our minds is possible, because if it's within imagination of a human being, that it can be done by a human being, unfortunately. So, so I think it just acts that political baseline really just acts as the ba as as the base, the fundament fundamental base of the city, and then for the city to elevate to a near level of conscience. Yes, that discussion of of why, where, who it's very very important. But that again is when the fundamentals are in place, and that's my opinion. But do you, so, I mean, do you think the philosopher's concern is ultimately political or is it, does it kind of transcend itself? Like once the political is established, I mean that like the divided line or something, we kind of get this image of once beyond uh, visible objects, we're in contact with the ideas themselves. So I just, what do you think, what is that impulse or that motivation towards truth and how does that fit with the political? I think really it's just, it simply, I don't think it exactly fits with the political, but I think the political is simply what we need for that next step to actually happen. Because for if you if you start self-actualizing when your conscience isn't properly in place, I don't think that makes much sense. Because essentially, you and yourself doesn't have a vanguard against corruption. I'm not going to say you're a pure person because there's no such person. So if you don't have that conscience that is pressing down on your, let's say, we can call them negative or or bad impulses, let's say, we can call them that, then what, what Plato emphasizes is moderation, which is essentially what I'm saying. But this is, we need this for our minds to be free of, our, for example, let's say our bodily desires, to be able to transcend those limits and really move on to something a lot more theoretical and really move on to new level of philosophy. So my opinion is, yes, this is what we should aim for. And, but in order for, uh, <clears throat> sorry, in order for our minds to be as clear as possible and for our minds to be unbiased in our self-actualization process, that moral conscious is an essential part that will build up to this. It's not that these two things are different. It's just it's a process. And this is simply, I think that moral moral vanguard is simply the first process in self-actualization. Because if without that moral vanguard properly actually working, that will mean that in some way your mind is biased a little more. Because 
a moral, your moral vanguard or your conscience is also a vanguard, not only against bad moral desires or negative, negative desires or impulses, but we're also against uh, not self-love exactly, but almost egotisticness or, or narcissism or your own biased opinion of yourself slash of other things. And although, of course, I can't say having a really good moral conscience would erase that, it would at the very least act as again i keep using this word vanguard against against that the, against the desires and if it if it can act as a repeller for that bias then obviously the self actualization process will be far easier and also would f- make far more sense to have that self actualization process after those things are kind of in place and that's that i think applies for the city itself as well yeah, I think this is kind of a, this is an interesting place we're in, and it's sort of answering a question I had in the back of my head regarding your distinction between artificial virtues and then kind of, you know, real experience or something like the, the, the genuine virtues. And I was wondering, you know, maybe, like, is there a place in a, a time at which, you know, these artificial virtues do become real? Because, I mean, I think that's Plato's concern is that, you know, like music and arithmetic and math, these all have a very concrete way in which they can affect us. Um, and I think you almost sort of answered that to some extent. So it's sort of blurring this distinction, I think, in an interesting way. Um, yeah, I'm wondering what you make of that. If, sure. if theory can somehow inform, you know, what, what you're calling our actual virtues and have a, have a real world effect, you know, and it also pertains to, you know, like us reading books, you know, I think it's a, it's a legitimate, um, question and lots at stake within the essay i think i do mention that not all people will immediately be turned away because i think plato's method can will be effective to some people for obvious reasons and sometimes those artificial those artificial virtues might solidify to actual virtues even though they're created by artificial means that's completely possible and that's possible but i was simply within this i was talking about the likelihood of that of that danger that it, that presents and that risk that presents for a city and that was why i kind of realistically grounded that and said that would there are flaws to that but to to some extent i think artificial although i do call them artificial virtues because it's artificial does i don't mean they don't work it's simply that there is a bigger danger of them not working properly is simply the reason for example the wind is going to blow no matter what. But if we use a fan to blow that wind, then there's a danger of the electricity going out, of the fan getting clogged, of the fan not working for some strange reason, or maybe something within the gears are messed up. There is, some, of course, the fact that there's going to be a wind or there is obviously it's going to function is there. It's simply that the danger of that fan breaking is far greater than the wind is not going to blow tomorrow which I think is really the point that we should be focusing on. Yeah. I, all right. Um, I hate to do this, but um, time's up. Mm-hmm.